It is, it, I, I want to say, it is a brave women of, of a, men and women of ATF who do do this. The conventional wisdom was we would never get any Republicans to support gun legislation, period. There's far too much gun violence, but that's why the summit is so important. Adhere to established operating procedures in place to mitigate risk of firearms being lost and stolen. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Though they don't take some of the guns from all the people, they take all of the guns from some of the people. Uh, your right to own a gun can also be restricted if you suffer from mental illness. Trigger warning. This is a pistol brace. I know it's scary. It fits on your forearm like this. Is added another piece that grips the handgun. Some say the Biden administration has made historic progress on actions to reduce gun violence, while others argue that they are infringing on Americans' right to bear firearms. The Supreme Court had something to say about this when it came to a new law on pistol braces. Let's dive in. ATF Power Drunk? The ATF is a law enforcement agency that is responsible for enforcing federal laws related to firearms, alcohol, tobacco, and explosives. However, the ATF also has the authority to make regulations that interpret these laws. This means that the ATF can effectively create new laws without the approval of Congress. Some Americans believe that the ATF has too much authority when it comes to making laws. People argue that this authority is unconstitutional as it gives the ATF the power to regulate firearms without the consent of the people. They also argue that the ATF has a history of abusing its authority by creating regulations that are overly burdensome and that do not have a clear basis in law. Some people also believe that the ATF's enforcement actions have been inconsistent and subject to political influence. Critics point to instances where the agency has been accused of targeting specific individuals or groups based on political motivations rather than objective enforcement of the law. This perceived bias can erode trust and raise concerns about the agency's exercise of power. You got to destroy the pistol brace and you use it with your handgun, handicapped or otherwise. You've got to register it within 120 days with the ATF, or you've got to surrender your pistol to the ATF, or you have to destroy your pistol, or punishable by five to 10 years in prison and fines of up to $250,000. Unless you self-identify as an idiot, you can see what's going on here. The ATF says, pistol braces turn pistols into are heavily restricted. Pistol braces were invented to help handicapped people, particularly handicapped veterans. The biggest argument is that the ATF has been able to exercise significant power without sufficient oversight from Congress. Rather than passing specific laws, the agency has relied on regulatory actions and reinterpretation of existing laws to shape policy. Americans say this can lead to concerns about an unelected agency making significant decisions that impact citizens' rights without direct accountability to the people. The biggest recent example of this is the fact that the ATF, in the beginning of 2023, proposed a rule that would have reclassified pistol braces as firearms under the National Firearms Act. This would have subjected pistol braces to the same regulations as short-barreled rifles, making it much more difficult to be owned by regular Americans. Gun rights groups argued that this rule was unconstitutional and a blow to their Second Amendment rights. They also argued that the rule was unnecessary, as pistol braces are not typically used to commit crimes. With the uproar that followed, events White House got involved and had to take a stand on the issue. But you can get in between Americans and their right to bear arms. Let's take a closer look into how that played out. Pistol brace is also known, the scary piece of equipment here, Pistol braces were invented to help handicapped people, particularly handicapped veterans. That there are as many as 40 million pistol braces in the United States. I would say virtually all of them are owned by law-abiding. Pistol brace doesn't change the caliber of the pistol, doesn't make it more powerful. The pistol brace doesn't make the pistol and automatic pencil. The pistol brace also does not help the shooter load the pistol more quickly, which is important, particularly if you're handicapped. Why is the ATF trying to say a pistol is no longer a pistol? 
if you use a pistol brace, it's a short barrel rifle. The ATF says pistol braces turn pistols into are heavily restricted. The ATF can require the owner of the pistol with the pistol brace. This is what they can do. This is what you have to do if you own a pistol brace. New pistol brace law. The pistol brace rule was a proposed rule by the ATF that would have reclassified pistol braces as firearms under the National Firearms Act. This would have subjected pistol braces to the same regulations as short-barreled rifles, including registration, a $200 tax stamp, and a longer waiting period. The rule was proposed in January 2023 and was set to go into effect in March 2023. However, it was met with widespread opposition from gun rights groups who argued that it was an unconstitutional infringement on their Second Amendment rights. On March 7, 2023, the House of Representatives passed a resolution to overturn the rule. The resolution passed by a vote of 219 to 210, with all Republicans and two Democrats voting in favor. Recently, House Republicans delivered a blow to the Biden administration's federal regulation on this law, voting in favor of the National Rifle Association-supported resolution that aims to overturn the rule. The measure would nullify the ATF rule that regulates stabilizing braces for pistols and prevent the ATF from reintroducing the same rule in the future. Pistol braces are accessories that can be attached to the rear of a gun to make it easier to fire with one hand. The accessories are often used by disabled veterans and other Americans. The ATF rule categorizes pistols with braces as short-barreled rifles, which require a federal license to own. The resolution passed nearly along party lines, with two Democrats voting in support and two Republicans voting against the measure. President Biden has accused the gun industry of attempting to circumvent federal regulations by selling stabilizing braces, which he and his administration claim can essentially convert a pistol into a short-barreled rifle. The NRA, which has been fighting the pistol brace rule since it was first floated in 2021, celebrated the measure's passage to block this unlawful rule. The pistol brace rule was finalized in January 2023, with Americans given until May 31 to register their firearm with the ATF or remove the accessories from their weapons. Those who do not comply with the regulation could face up to 10 years imprisonment or $10,000 in fines, or both, according to the ATF. The full impact of the law wasn't immediately clear. The order applied only to the plaintiffs in the case. Two gun owners, a company that makes pistols with stabilizing braces, and a gun rights group. The appeals court did not say whether the rule was blocked for others, including people who buy the guns from the company, Maxim Defense Industries, and members of the Firearms Policy Coalition. The NRA, state lawmakers, and other Second Amendment groups have battered the Biden administration with criticisms for subjecting legal gun owners to potential felony charges, including via an NRA-backed lawsuit challenging the rule in February and the NRA filing an injunction to halt the ATF from enforcing the rule in June 2023. House Democrats who voted against the measure argued that the rule could save lives, citing the use of pistol braces by mass shooters. Republican Georgia Rep. Andrew Clyde, who introduced the measure, said in comments provided to Fox News Digital that pistol braces are commonly used by law-abiding gun owners, especially disabled veterans, and described the passage of the measure as sending a resounding message to the judicial system that the ATF rule is unconstitutional. Clyde said, Every day, millions of Americans, including many service-disabled veterans, rely on stabilizing braces to exercise their Second Amendment freedoms. Yet through the ATF's rule, the Biden administration is attempting to circumvent Congress's sole legislative authority by using executive fiat to turn these law-abiding gun owners into criminals for simply attaching this beneficial brace to their firearm. This bill would have done nothing to curb the actions of illegal-minded criminals intent on harming our children. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Though they don't take some of the guns from all the people, they take all of the guns from some of the people. But it will harm the law-abiding citizens of this great nation by violating their second, fourth, fifth, and fourteenth amendment. This is completely unacceptable. I stand against it and I encourage all members of the House to vote against it. By passing H.J. Res. 44, the House has sent a resounding message to both the judicial system and the nation that it firmly rejects the ATF's unconstitutional rule and executive overreach, 
unapologetically defends service-disabled veterans' unalienable right to keep and bear arms, and refuses to back down in the fight to protect all Americans' Second Amendment liberties. Republican North Carolina Rep. Richard Hudson, who helped spearhead the measure with Clyde, slammed the Biden administration's rule as blatant bureaucratic overreach that circumvented Congress. Just before this incident, the White House said Biden would veto the measure if it reaches his desk. In a statement, the White House said, The rationale is clear. Short-barreled rifles are more concealable than long guns, yet more dangerous and accurate at a distance than traditional pistols. As a result of this industry innovation, in the past few years we have witnessed mass shooters, including those in Dayton, Ohio and Boulder, Colorado, use these brace devices on heavy pistols in order to inflict mass damage. The resolution is now headed to the Senate. If passed by the Senate and subsequently vetoed by Biden, the House and Senate would need a two-thirds majority vote to override the presidential veto. Biden under fire This isn't the first time the Biden administration has come under fire for changing gun laws. On April 11, 2022, President Biden announced a new final rule issued by the ATF that said that regulating guns that can be assembled at home. These guns are known as ghost guns, reflecting the fact that because they lack serial numbers, these guns cannot be traced back to their owners. The new rule makes changes to earlier regulations adopted under the Gun Control Act of 1968. One especially notable change is that the new rule expands the definition of firearm, making gun kits equivalent to pre-assembled regulated firearms. One important consequence is that anyone seeking to buy a gun kit must undergo a background check. Any privately assembled firearms, that is, firearms assembled from a kit, that do not come with identifying markings, must be identified or marked by whoever is assembling the gun so that law enforcement officials can trace them. President Biden justified the new rule by pointing to the increasing availability of ghost guns and an increase in crime committed using ghost guns. In 2020, Local law enforcement agencies reported 8,712 suspected ghost guns to the ATF, which represents a more than 400% increase from 2016. Proponents of the rule argue that it is necessary to close loopholes in gun regulation. They also support the rule as a necessary public safety measure. Former ATF agent David Chipman argues that the rule does not impose much of a burden because the only people who buy ghost guns are people who want to avoid background checks such as criminals or extremists. Critics, however, have raised legal questions about the rule. They argue, first, that the Justice Department has exceeded its statutory authority. This argument rests on critics' reading of a provision in the Firearms Owners Protection Act of 1986 that amends the Gun Control Act to allow the Attorney General to prescribe only such rules and regulations as are necessary. Because these critics think that regulations of unassembled kits are not necessary to public safety, they contend that the Justice Department has exceeded its limited rulemaking authority. Individuals who submitted comments to the ATF in opposition to its rule also argued that the rule's definition of firearm to include unassembled kits runs contrary to the Gun Control Act's definition of firearm. These commenters argued that because the Gun Control Act defines a firearm as a weapon that can be readily converted to expel projectiles, Expanding the initial definition of a firearm to include weapons kits contradicts the plain reading of the statute. Supporters of the rule, though, counter that the Justice Department has the authority to adopt the rule under the Gun Control Act because the rule is consistent with Congress's intent to regulate the core component of the firearm. The Justice Department also argues that the Gun Control Act's definition of firearm covers weapons that can be easily converted to fire, not just weapons that are pre-assembled and ready to fire. If the rule is defended as falling within a broad reading of the word firearm, critics say that this raises a different problem. The rule then violates the non-delegation doctrine. Under that doctrine, statutes cannot give open-ended authority to agencies because only the U.S. Congress has the constitutionally granted power to write laws. A majority of the justices currently on the U.S. Supreme Court have expressed sympathy for increasing scrutiny of laws on this basis. At a minimum, any grant of authority must be based on statute-based guidelines directing officials how to exercise delegated power. But the Gun Control Act, critics argue, does not contain an intelligible principle to guide ATF's rulemaking. The Justice Department responded to non-delegation critiques by noting that the Supreme Court has found that statutes authorizing agencies to regulate in the public interest 
contain intelligible principles. Lawmakers have expressed concern about the rule as well. On April 14, 2022, U.S. Senators Ted Cruz, James Lankford, and Mike Lee announced that they would introduce a joint resolution of disapproval of the rule pursuant to the Congressional Review Act. Senator Lankford called the rule another attempt by the Biden administration to strip law-abiding citizens of their Second Amendment rights, and Senator Lee argued that the rule violates the Firearm Owners Protection Act's prohibition of a federal gun registry. In a federal lawsuit filed in Texas, a judge ruled that Seller Division 80's prediction that the rule would destroy its entire business was not enough to grant the company's request to block the rule with a nationwide injunction. The National Rifle Association criticized the regulations severely. In recent years, sales of ghost gun kits have caused concerns for all levels of law enforcement. From the Federal Justice Department to city police departments, authorities struggled to curb the proliferation of these weapons, which were increasingly being recovered at crime scenes across the country. According to the White House, there were approximately 20,000 suspected ghost gun recoveries reported to ATF last year alone. These guns have often been sold as build-your-own kits that contain all or almost all of the parts needed to quickly build an unmarked gun, and anyone could sell or buy these guns without a background check. That changes today. This rule will make it harder for criminals and other prohibited persons to obtain untraceable guns. It will help to ensure that law enforcement officers can retrieve the information they need to solve crimes, and it will help reduce the number of untraceable firearms flooding our communities. Attorney General Merrick Garland said, This law was passed successfully. Because this new federal rule, several states and territories had already restricted or banned ghost guns, including California, Connecticut, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Washington, and the District of Columbia. Zero Tolerance Policy The ATF's Zero Tolerance Policy for Firearm Dealers was announced in June 2021 by the Biden administration. The policy is designed to crack down on gun dealers who violate federal gun laws. Under the policy, the ATF will revoke the licenses of firearm dealers who willfully violate gun laws even if the violation is a first offense. This includes violations such as selling a gun to a prohibited person, failing to run a background check, falsifying records, and refusing a federal inspection. As always, guns right activists were not happy with this law. After all, as a result of it, in 2022, ATF revoked gun store licenses at a higher rate than in any year since 2006. Texas had 11 shops revoked, the most in the nation. Texas historically has been home to the most gun shops in the country, with more than 11,000 licensed. ATF took eight licenses in Kansas and six in both North Carolina and Ohio. It even publicly named a portion of the stores whose licenses were revoked the first time this has ever happened. The National Shooting Sports Foundation, which represents gun manufacturers and shops, wrote that it opposes weaponizing the zero-tolerance policy by naming and shaming shops for what it described as minor clerical errors. Congressman Matt Gates slammed the director of the ATF, Stephen Dettelbach, for this law and the fact that the ATF had lost some of the guns they had confiscated. Bump Stocks Controversy The ATF's classification of certain firearm accessories, like bump stocks, as mash gun has been a topic of controversy and debate in recent years. But to really understand this problem, we need to delve into the background and events surrounding the ATF's decision. A bump stock is an accessory that can be attached to a semi-auto firearm, enabling it to mimic the firing speed of a fully semi-auto firearm. It achieves this by utilizing the gun's recoil to rapidly bump the firearm against the shooter's stationary finger, resulting in a continuous firing motion. Bump stocks gained significant attention following the tragic mass shooting in Las Vegas in October 2017, where the gunman used firearms equipped with bump stocks to enhance the rate of fire. This was among the deadliest shooter attacks in American history. The gunman, Stephen Paddock, carried out the attack from a hotel suite on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino. During the shooting, Paddock opened fire on a crowd of concertgoers attending the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival which was taking place across the street from the hotel. He used a variety of firearms, including semi-auto rifles equipped with bump stocks. The use of bump stocks allowed Paddock to effectively increase the rate of fire of his semi-auto rifles. By utilizing the firearm's recoil, the bump stock enabled him to achieve a rapid bumping action 
that facilitated a continuous firing motion, simulating the rate of fire of a fully semi-auto firearm. Paddock fired multiple rounds into the crowd below, resulting in the loss of 60 people, including himself, and injuring more than 800 others. This wasn't the only incident, however. In March 2018, following the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting, Florida enacted a law which, among other things, banned bump stocks. The Stoneman Douglas High School shooting occurred on February 14, 2018 in Parkland. It was a tragic incident that resulted in the demise of 17 people, including 14 students and three staff members, and left numerous others injured. The perpetrator, Nicholas Cruz, was a 19-year-old former student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. He entered the school campus armed with an AR-15-style semi-auto rifle with a bump stock attachment and began shooting indiscriminately. The attack took place during school hours, causing panic and chaos as students and staff tried to seek shelter and escape. The shooting lasted for approximately six minutes before Cruz fled the scene by blending in with the students exiting the building. He was later apprehended by law enforcement officers in a nearby community. In the aftermath of the shooting, the incident shocked the nation and sparked a renewed debate about gun control, school safety, and mental health. Survivors of the shooting, along with families and community members, became vocal advocates for stricter gun control measures and initiated a nationwide movement known as March for Our Lives. Florida government responded. The portion of their legislation banning bump stocks took effect in October 2018, and possession in Florida is a third-degree felony. These attacks shocked USA and led to renewed discussions about gun control, bump stock regulations, and public safety measures. In response to the Las Vegas shooting, there was a push for legislative action to address the use of bump stocks. However, rather than passing new laws, the ATF initiated a regulatory process to reevaluate the classification of bump stocks under existing laws. Under the National Firearms Act and the Gun Control Act, the definition of a mash gun includes any device that is designed to increase the rate of fire of a firearm. In 2010, the ATF had previously concluded that bump stocks did not meet the definition of a mash gun as they did not mechanically alter the firearm's internal components. However, in March 2018, the ATF issued a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking to classify bump stocks as mash guns. The agency's rationale was that bump stocks, by facilitating the continuous firing of a firearm with a single pull of the trigger, fell within the definition of a mash gun under the NFA and GCA. The NPRM attracted significant public attention, and during the comment period, the ATF received a large number of comments both in support and against the proposed reclassification. Nevertheless, in December 2018, the ATF issued a final rule reclassifying bump stocks as mash guns. The rule set a deadline for individuals to destroy or turn in their bump stocks, making their possession illegal. This decision sparked controversy and legal challenges from various groups, including gun rights advocates who argued that the ATF's reclassification exceeded the agency's statutory authority and violated the Second Amendment rights of gun owners. However, courts generally upheld the ATF's authority to reclassify bump stocks, emphasizing the agency's discretion in interpreting and applying existing laws. In response to the ATF's reclassification, some members of Congress proposed legislation to explicitly ban bump stocks, resulting in the passage of the Bump Stock Ban in March 2019. This legislation amended the definition of a mash gun under federal law to include bump stocks and other similar devices. But in April 2023, a second federal appeals court struck down the nationwide ban to bump stocks devices. A three-judge panel of the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, Ohio, sided with a Kentucky man, anesthesiologist Scott Harden, who had sued to challenge the rule in 2019. The court said that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives went beyond its legal authority when it banned the devices by classifying them as mash guns, parts, in 2017. The New Orleans-based Fifth Circuit already struck down the ban in a separate case in January 2023. President Joe Biden's administration has asked the U.S. Supreme Court to hear its appeal of that decision, saying it threatened significant harm to public safety. At first, when Hardin claimed in his lawsuit that the rule went beyond ATF's authority, U.S. District Judge David Hale disagreed, ruling in favor of the ATF. Then, Sixth Circuit Judge Ronald Lee Gilman wrote that the 1934 law 
must be interpreted according to the rule of lenity, which requires ambiguity in a criminal statute to be resolved in criminal defendants' favor. Because the relevant statutory scheme does not clearly and unambiguously prohibit bump stocks, we are bound to construe the statute in Hardin's favor, the judge wrote. Circuit Judge David McKeague joined in the opinion. Circuit Judge John Bush wrote in a separate concurring opinion that the federal law was not ambiguous and clearly did not cover bump stocks. Other opponents of the ban also argue that bump stocks do not fall under the definition of illegal guns in federal law. The ATF, on the other hand, says they do, a position now being defended by the Biden administration. Sadly, they did not win the battle with Hardin. We are happy with this decision and hope the ATF recognizes its duty to abide by the law as written, instead of unilaterally replacing statutory definitions with agency-created definitions which wrongfully criminalize legal conduct," said Alan Cobb, a lawyer for Hardin. Biden's Controversial Budget President Biden's budget proposal for fiscal year 2024 includes a whopping $1.9 billion for the ATF a massive increase of millions of dollars from the previous year's budget. The proposal comes as the ATF faces increased scrutiny over its efforts to further regulate firearms, which includes the implementation of the multiple controversial rules we've just seen. If approved, Biden's budget would increase funding for the ATF by roughly $200 million, or 13.6%, compared to the fiscal year 2023 budget. It would also mark a $663 million increase, or 50%, from former President Obama's final budget in fiscal year 2017. According to the White House, the additional funding would go towards further regulating the firearms industry, including implementing the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, creating gun trafficking strike forces, and enforcing background checks. Republican lawmakers have taken steps to combat the ATF's rules, including introducing legislation that would expand the rights of gun owners across the country such as protecting the gun rights of full-time travelers. Some lawmakers have also demanded ATF Director Stephen Dettelbach testify before the House Judiciary Committee over the agency's efforts to implement its new rules. Beyond the ATF funding, Biden's $6.9 trillion budget proposal has received sharp criticism from Republicans in Congress, with some referring to it as funky voodoo accounting. NCLA's Request on ATF's Unilateral Bump Stock Ban the new Civil Liberties Alliance, a nonpartisan, nonprofit civil liberties organization, has filed a brief agreeing that the U.S. Supreme Court should grant the U.S. Solicitor General's cert petition in the Garland v. Cargill case. How many guns has the ATF lost? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. As a kid, I came out of a different movement, the civil rights movement. Is it a difficult question to understand? Uh, well, <laughs> I... Our it takes extraordinary courage for them to stand up here and retell the story. I don't know if you're referring to uh, any particular incident or... As many of you out there, either parents, relatives, and or victims yourself. No guns were lost. They were stolen by an individual who's now in prison. That petition asks the court to hear NCLA's challenge to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives Unilateral Bump Stock Ban. Contrary to the Solicitor General, however, NCLA's brief urges the court to affirm the recent on-bank decision of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, which held that ATF's regulatory ban conflicts with the federal statute defining machine guns. ATF issued a final rule in 2018 defining semi-auto firearms with bump stocks as mash guns, which federal law prohibits. That rule reversed ATF's long-standing recognition that bump stock-equipped firearms are not illegal mash guns. The rule required NCLA's client, Texas gun shop owner and Army veteran Michael Cargill, and half a million other Americans, to either destroy or turn in legally purchased bump stocks. In January, the on-bank U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit ruled in Cargill v. Garland that banning bump stocks requires an act of Congress, a major victory for NCLA. That ruling agrees with a subsequent decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and an earlier one from the Navy Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals, but it conflicts with Tenth Circuit and D.C. Circuit decisions rejecting challenges to ATF's final rule. The resulting circuit court split makes Solicitor General Elizabeth Preloger's cert petition one likely to be granted. 
in areas that are poor, mostly minority, there's a mass shooting. Right. Uh, who was right. not and an right. ATF employee. But there were recommendations made on what you should do so that you don't become the victim of the theft. Connecticut delegation, which is incredible. I think on this issue and many others, you're the best delegation in the United States. Thousands of firearms, firearms, parts, and ammunition had been stolen from the ATF. So she, she proves you can run for office and in gun violence in the South and you can win. You gave testimony that the brave ATF agents are the ones showing up at two in the morning after a burglary. You can prevent the next tragedy. You can save life. You can save families in the process. But it seems as though in this case, you are the one burglarized. Why have you not followed the recommendations? The Constitution provides that only Congress may enact new criminal laws. Congress adopted a statute banning mash guns in 1986 that did not mention bump stocks. ATF is not authorized to draft regulations expanding the reach of criminal laws beyond the scope of what Congress prohibited. NCLA urges the Supreme Court to resolve this issue and safeguard Americans' rights against administrative agency power grabs. If and when it hears this case, NCLA is confident the court will uphold the Fifth Circuit's ruling that bump stocks are not mash guns. NCLA released the following statements. Richard Samp, senior litigation counsel at NCLA, emphasized that the Fifth Circuit's decision highlighted the importance of the rule of lenity which states that ambiguities in criminal statutes should be interpreted against the government. This approach ensures that ordinary citizens are not punished unless they have clear notice of prohibited conduct. NCLA is urging the Supreme Court to address whether the rule of lenity requires the rejection of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives rule in the case of Mr. Cargill, should it agree to hear the case. Mark Chenoweth, President and General Counsel at NCLA clarified that the case does not revolve around gun control, but rather the control of law itself. Some months later, during an ATF audit, I was told the background check was now a non-approval. We are not finished. We are not finished. We are not finished. The, the bump stock itself is, is an attachment that replaces the buttstock of the rifle. Details of the law, but folks, listen at home. Here's a quick summary of what this law is doing. It's already allowing. I completed their background check using Florida's FDLE firearm purchasing program. Put your finger over this and then push forward here. It basically will put your finger on that trigger. To run enhanced background checks on young people under 21 trying to buy a firearm. He expressed concerns that if the ATF is allowed to rewrite statutes, such as banning bump stocks, it sets a dangerous precedent for the agency to exert more power than Congress intended. Despite Michael Cargill's victory in the lower court, NCLA does not oppose the government's petition for a writ of certiorari, as it believes it is crucial for the Supreme Court to assess the lawfulness of the ATF's bump stock ban and reaffirm Congress's authority. EPA Ruling The U.S. Supreme Court has limited the authority for the Environmental Protection Agency to write its own rules without clear congressional authorization, which Congress intended to delegate to the EPA. The ruling in West Virginia v. Environmental Protection Agency, one of the Supreme Court's final rulings for the 2022 term, found that the EPA, as an administrative agency, doesn't have the legal authority to make its own rules. The decision was based on the separation of powers principle and legislative intent. Chief Justice John Roberts, along with Justices Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, found that the EPA couldn't point to clear congressional authorization for the authority it claimed. With it off safe, um, just that little bit of motion, you can hear the click. This legislation has already provided more than $230 million. Close to 50,000 background checks over 46 years. Why would I willfully ignore this background check? It will shoot, then it comes back forward. The rifle will then cycle and, and cock again. Court has the right to temporarily remove, temporarily remove a firearm where there's danger to themselves or others. In the Second Amendment, says it shall not be infringed, and the word infringe means by banning parts on firearms. From gun violence as a consequence of suicide than anything else that happens in the nation. Even though FDLE made the error, it was on my paperwork, so ATF deemed it a willful error. 
The majority decision stated that the EPA could not make its own rules under the Major Questions Doctrine, as agencies have only those powers given to them by Congress. Justices Gorsuch and Alito explained that Congress alone has the authority to pass laws representing the will of the people. Lawmaking that is delegated to unaccountable bureaucracies belies the intent of ensuring rule by executive fiat and prevents whipsaw rulemaking that gets overturned by each presidential administration. They believed that the power to make new laws regulating private conduct was a grave one. It is, it, I, I want to say, that it is a brave women of, of eight, men and women of ATF who do do this. The conventional wisdom was we would never get any Republicans to support gun legislation, period. I, well, I know what they're doing. I know what they're doing. Every they're day. getting robbed on one hand, so you can't keep a hold of the guns you're supposed to have. Which many have described as the most significant gun safety law in 30 years, and it is. Firearms data. ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. But for me, and for most of you, here's what it really is. It's an important first step. As a result of breaking the law, didn't you guys have to go and delete like a quarter of a million records that you illegally kept? That could pose a serious threat to individual liberty. In a world like that, agencies could churn out new laws more or less at whim, causing intrusions on liberty, instability, and powerful special interests. This creeps towards a tyrannical administrative state, as the Constitution does not authorize agencies to use pen and phone regulations as substitutes for laws passed by the people's representatives. Unilaterally redefining The decision to limit the EPA's authority to promulgate rules over cap-and-trade schemes doesn't seem like a direct translation to the Department of Justice, DOJ, and ATF until it's looked at through the lens of executive agencies claiming legislative authority where it does not exist. The DOJ and ATF claimed authority to rewrite the rules defining what is a frame and receiver and define AR pistols as short-barreled rifles under the 1968 Gun Control Act and the 1934 National Firearms Act. In both laws, however, the authority for ATF to do so doesn't exist. In fact, defining firearms is explicitly the authority of Congress. Congress set the definition of what constitutes a firearm in the 1968 Gun Control Act. In the case of reclassifying AR pistols as short-barreled rifles, these definitions were created by Congress. Congress alone has the authority to rewrite them. Neither of the laws include provisions allowing agencies, including the ATF or the Attorney General, to rewrite definitions of what constitutes a firearm on their own. Another tragedy is school, a grocery store, a parade, or a place in America. Honestly, I feel like that as well. And yeah. ATF has implemented uh, numerous different safety measures with respect to the national uh, destructive brand. Well, I mean, there's far too much gun violence, but that's why the summit is so important. Adhere to established operating procedures in place to mitigate risk of firearms being lost and stolen. We did pass the most meaningful gun safety law in 30 years. That shows an ATF that is not functioning correctly and is not responding to the problems you create. We did overcome an unrelenting opposition of the gun lobby to gun manufacturers and so many politicians who hide behind the belief. The DOJ, through the ATF, appears to be overstepping their congressional authority to redefine frames and receivers differently from how Congress defined the terms in statute. Similarly, the agencies are attempting to redefine what is classified as short-barreled rifles and subject them to the NFA regulations, including taxes, photo and fingerprint submission, and onerous background checks. The role of the ATF and DOJ is to enforce the 1934 NFA and 1968 Gun Control Act. DOJ and ATF have the congressionally delegated authority to faithfully implement those laws through rulemaking. But that delegated authority doesn't authorize them to change the law on their own to match advancements in technology or their view of good public policy. The major question with the DOJ's proposed rules is where do they derive congressional authority to assert this power? The rules, in light of the WV versus EPA ruling, appear to be out of bounds. I have been a firearms dealer for 46 years. For 46 years, I've had a good relationship with law enforcement. They oppose common sense gun legislation. And we beat them. We beat them. 
Then came the ATF's zero tolerance policy. We all want our kids to have the freedom to learn, to read and to write, instead of learning how to duck and cover in a classroom. The understanding Hundreds of is thousands searchable. And so that's what you guys do. You keep what you shouldn't keep. You lose what you're not supposed to lose. The Supreme Court's decision is a welcome and necessary check on the growth of the undemocratic administrative state. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.